I can't thank you enough for your attention uh, this morning. Uh, you have been uh, fabulous. It's been, it's been wonderful that you've come, and I hope that it's been of some benefit to you. This can be a very difficult session. Looking at uh, loss is a difficult subject. Thinking about what it's like to lose a spouse is a very, very personal and very difficult and emotional thing to experience. The display table over here has a number of things on it that uh, maybe you could find something there that might be of help to you. Uh, the display table here, uh, those are my books. By the way, if you want to know what the uh, unpardonable sin is, you've probably sat in Bible classes where you've fussed about that subject before. The unpardonable sin is stealing the preacher's books in the house of the Lord. <laughs> those are my books, okay? That's a display table. But there are some really great books over there, and I'm going to read some quotes out of some of those books to begin this session. I've also written two books on this subject. One is When the End Comes. The other is Before the End Comes. There's a third one now in the works after the end comes. It's a trilogy, and that's it. I mean, this third one, it's been hard. But I'm hoping that maybe we can get it out late summer this year. Uh, those two books of mine are over here on the wall. Uh, I don't push them hard, but uh, they're available over there if you'd be interested in them. Uh, if we sell those that are on the table, there's some in the box below. Uh, the first one, when the end comes, is $8. The other is $9 before the end comes. You can get them uh, from Amazon if you'd like to order them that way. I uh, felt like after dealing with it personally and then looking at resources available to help the widowed, I really thought that there ought to be more Christians write about this subject. And I appreciate those uh, who have uh, written about that subject, especially in the last few months. Some of you uh, received a half sheet that is um, a save the date reminder about a unique event that we have. It is a widow widower retreat. Uh, my family hosts this uh, five years ago. It'll be five years ago this July. Uh, we decided that if in the brotherhood we have youth meetings and we have family encampments and we have uh, leadership training seminars, why don't we have widow widower retreats? And so we started this. It's the only thing like it I know of in the Brotherhood. And uh, this past year, we had uh, just shy of 100 people that came from 16 different states. They ranged in age from their 30s to their 90s. And we had a ball. It is, it is not, it is not a, a cry fest. Let me also mention, it's not a dating service or a marriage factory. <laughs> I, I have to point this out. When churches start local widowhood ministries, I said, make sure that you explain, this is not a cry fest, this is not a dating service, this is not a marriage factory. If they want to do that stuff, they're on their own. But um, there are things that sometimes happen as a result of that interaction. But anyway... Um, we have really enjoyed hosting this for the past four years. We're looking forward to uh, this year. Uh, this year, we're going to have uh, Brother Jeff Jenkins be with us. Uh, Jeff is a preacher, has been a preacher in Louisville, Texas, for a number of years. Uh, lost his wife, Laura, uh, three years this June, and he's going to be speaking at that event uh, uh, this year. His book, as a matter of fact, uh, is on this table over here to, to my left. But uh, I want to encourage you to take a look at some of those books, and if there is some value in any of those books. If you don't know how to order books on Amazon, you just pick out the ones you want, take a picture of them, then hand your phone to somebody younger than you are. <laughs> it's amazing. They can get them delivered right to your door. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, good material there that might be of benefit to you. Imagine a single event that will dramatically change your calendar, your checkbook, your friendship network, the contents of your refrigerator, the temperature you set your thermostat, your outlook on your future, and your connection with your children. And that's not all. Your appearance may change, your emotions, 
your sleep patterns, your theology, your social status, and possibly your address. I experienced most of these changes and more beginning April 21, 2006, the day I became a widow. I don't like that word and still will not check that box to identify myself. That book uh, is entitled From One Widow to Another. In another book over here called The Widow's Might, M-I-G-H-T, the author writes, if I could have one positive thing come from Dale's death, it would be the ability to explain in words the utter overwhelming sadness of the loss. One of the primary differences between the death of your spouse and the loss of anyone else is that you have a level of physical intimacy with your spouse that you just don't have with other people. That, combined with the sheer amount of time that you spend together, heightens the loss. Until you live it, I'm not sure you can totally wrap your thoughts around the crushing magnitude of losing a beloved spouse. Even as a strong woman with a powerful faith walk, a wonderful family, a large support group, I was brought to my knees by Dale's death. I've totally changed how I think about life, marriage, and myself. Whatever happens in the future, I will never be the same. H. Norman Wright is a faith-based counselor who's no longer with us. In a book that he wrote called The Reflections of a Grieving Spouse, the first book I ever read written by a male about the loss of his wife, He says, the loss of our spouses changes our entire lives. It shifts the foundation of our existence. Nothing is as it was. Even the familiar becomes unfamiliar. Every aspect of our lives is disrupted without our partners. Everything has to be relearned, just as flooded river does when it recedes and leaves behind a maze of new streams. In a culture that doesn't like to acknowledge loss or talk about its impact, grieving is difficult. And when we add this silence to the fact that most of us have never been taught about the process and normalcy of grief, no wonder we struggle. Prior to the death of your spouse, your life is going in a well-established direction. You had an identity. You could say who you were. That has changed. You're not exactly who you were. The person you lost was a part of your identity. You were someone's spouse, someone's partner. You continually are that in your heart and in your memory. But there's a place where your loved one stood that's now vacant. One lady said, the space inside of me previously occupied by that passionate relationship was strangely empty. I went from having someone think I was the most amazing person on earth to feeling invisible and vacant. Another lady wrote, in a book called The Confessions of a Mediocre Widow. During the first year, it seemed like I was in a constant state of emotional agony. I would sit with a photo album in my lap and flip through pictures of a man I couldn't believe was actually gone. Another lady said, ever since this happened, I feel like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, like a tornado has picked up my house and is spinning it around and I just want to know where it's going to land. One nurse who cooperated with a fellow with a pastoral background, they wrote a book together that's called Getting to the Other Side of Grief. It's the book that I would, if you're a reader kind of a person, I would most recommend that book, Getting to the Other Side of Grief. In that book, you have the male perspective, the female perspective, and they really are very blunt and very practical in how they handle it and very transparent. The lady with a nursing background wrote this in a part of that book. I wanted to kill myself. Going to bed at night was so hard. I prayed that God would let me die. I wanted out of this life. Now, you may be thinking, well, those people are not Christians. Those people are not my brothers and sisters in the Lord. Well, if you want to hear from some of them, brace yourself. I just cleaned my husband's room 
and wash the last sheets that he slept on. Marilyn said, so hard. I probably could have washed those sheets with my tears. Jackie over in Arkansas said, I wasn't a person anymore. Couples turned their backs on me. Marcia, who was married to Bob Stapleton, longtime missionaries in Chamala, Tanzania, East Africa. After 47 years of marriage, she said, I know I have to do my best each day, but it is hard at times. I never dreamed it would be this difficult. An experienced Christian, strong Christian. A lady that doesn't live too far from here, September 17th, shared this. The mornings are so lonely. As I drink my coffee that he always made, I miss him reading scriptures because he had been up before me for a while. I long to hear his voice again. It's been 48 days and the ache is almost unbearable at times. I've gained a new respect for all who have lost someone that was the best part of us all. Back a couple of years ago, uh, Cheryl Wayne and I were down in Titusville, Florida, and we met Kathy. Kathy, in her 50s, lost her husband. On uh, April 14th, she texted me this and permitted me to share this publicly. I was told by a family member that loves me, quote, time will heal, but I don't think it is at all possible. 33 years of my life with my husband, sharing three children together, was my whole world. I can't see past today and the pain is too much. I could go on and on and on sharing with you the sentiments, the honest, transparent sentiments of people who are struggling with life after loss. You know, we have talked about uh, loss and loss is tough. During the 33 and a third years that I was with the Hartville Church of Christ in Hartville, Ohio, I was with virtually all those people, especially the ones who lost their spouses, pre-loss and at loss. And what I saw in all of them and what I learned from all of them was what a horrific thing it is to lose a spouse. I heard their cries. I saw their tears. We hugged together. We prayed together. What I learned from that experience was how awful it is to suffer the loss of a beloved spouse. What I was clueless about until my wife died was what their life was like after they lost their spouse. See, there's a difference between loss and life after loss. Loss is hard. Life after loss is harder. Life after loss is every day and every night. And you've got to deal with what life has gifted you you don't want. It's a struggle. It's not a struggle because we're Christians. It's a struggle because we're human. If we're blessed with a faith, even a strong faith, it is still going to be a personal struggle. The only problem with being a Christian is you still are human. And life can be awfully hard. Let me brag about my favorite widow. No um, offense to others that I've met. But this is Miss Millie. I met her at the Grosbeck Church of Christ on the north end of Cincinnati, Ohio. I was up there for a gospel meeting, and the preacher, Mark Phillips, came to me and said, Dean, I've got this 90-plus-year-old lady who wants to take you out to lunch. Now, having been married for 41 years at that point and having three daughters, I knew not to say no to a female, especially if she's 90-plus years old. So I told Mark, I said, Mark, go ahead and set it up. Any time is fine. Any day is fine. So Millie takes me to a Japanese restaurant, which I thought was weird. I didn't know 90-plus-year-old females ate at Japanese restaurants, but that's where she wanted to go. So we went to the Japanese restaurant, and the waiter took our order, and then the waiter left, and I did with her the same thing I 
do with all widowed people if I have some private time with them? I said, Millie, tell me your story. Tell me your story of love and loss. So she pr proceeded to tell me about those 63 years. It's a beautiful story. 63 years. She talked about them getting married and about the children. She talked about him getting cancer. She talked about taking care of him there at home with cancer. She talked to me about him passing away. After she told me that story, then she dropped this conversational bomb. She said, but that wasn't my first husband. I said, Millie, tell me about your first husband. She said, well, I was 19 years old. He was in General Patton's army in the Battle of the Bulge. And he died in that battle. She was 19 years old. And to add to the story, they already had one child, a little over a year old. And she was pregnant with the second child. And she's 19 years old. He dies in the Battle of the Bulge, and she had him buried in France. And I can say exactly what she said when she told me that. A decision that to this day, I regret. How did that 19-year-old young lady, one child over a year old, getting ready to then deliver a second child in the mid-1940s, how in the world did she survive? How in the world did she learn to cope? About four years later, uh, she married the second husband that embraced her children from the first marriage, and they lived in that second marriage for 63 years. In 2018, she died on July 4th. I thought, how appropriate in light of the loss of her first husband, July the 4th. After I heard her story, I would call her after I did a widowhood workshop, if I shared her story, I would call her. I got her telephone number for this very purpose. I would call and tell her, Millie, I told your story. I wanted her to know that her story was an inspirational story of survival that could encourage and inspire a lot of other people who experience horrific loss and wonder how in the world they're ever going to make it. Millie made it. I know the answer to how she did that. It's the only way you can. It's by the grace of God. There's life after loss. It's just real difficult. It can be rich and fulfilling and very meaningful. But it's going to be a very difficult journey to get to that point. Well, what are the risk factors? You know, in insurance, they're always concerned about the risk factors. Well, the first thing you get hitched. The second fact is you stick with it. And the third fact is your heart keeps beating. Then you're the one that's going to be up for the challenge. Stop and think about things that we would commonly associate with widowhood. This is when Denny, back there on the right, raised his hand and he said, old, something commonly associated with widowhood. Now, in our culture, you know, what are things that you would commonly associate with widowhood? Uh, anybody mention anything that you would associate with widowhood? Almost always, that's the first thing mentioned. Loneliness. It's a different kind of loneliness. It's like a loneliness on steroids. Uh, Kathy Lee Gifford, <clears throat> many of you maybe watched her on TV for a number of years on NBC in the morning. She was married to Frank Gifford, one of my uh, favorite, probably my favorite New York Giants football player. They, uh, they were married for 29 years. Uh, he died in 2015. Now, for those of you who don't know, she's down here in your turf. She lives in Franklin now. She left the New York City area and moved to Franklin. Now, I have seen video interviews with her, and I've also read in AARP, now I'm not old enough to get that magazine, <laughs> but I read in AARP magazine an article about her where she was interviewed. Let me share with you a couple of things. 
When she was asked, this was in the Tennessean newspaper, when she was asked why she moved to Franklin, she said, I moved here because I was dying of loneliness. In the AARP magazine, she described her loneliness as crippling loneliness. That's loneliness on steroids. You know, when you've wholly invested yourself into a relationship and now that relationship no longer exists, there is a loneliness that you have to learn to cope with that is a tremendous struggle. You know, the two most difficult places for a widowed person to go, I've come to this conclusion from interviewing many, many widowed people and reading many, many books about widowhood, the two hardest places for widowed people to go is number one, to bed. I don't know how many males and females I've talked to who for months slept on their couch, their sofa, before they could ever go back to bed in a bedroom, male and female. Going to bed is a brutal reminder of what you've lost. The second place that's really hard for a widowed person to go is right here, to church. Do you know what I would give to be able to hold the hands of my wife as we prayed publicly in the assembly when we were worshiping the Lord? Do you know how much I miss that? And I'll bet how much you all miss that. When you have made it a habit in your lives as the first and foremost thing to be devoted to the Lord and to worship Him regularly, and then you come to church by yourself, that is a really tough place to come. Some of the songs, oh, some of the songs. At my wife's memorial service, I asked a young man who worked at the funeral home that I did most of my funerals with in uh, Hartville, Ohio, I asked this young man if he would sing this song. I gave him a sheet of music, he, very musically gifted. I, I knew that from interacting with him in the funeral home business. And I said, would you sing this song? And the reason why I asked him to sing this song is because I, want, I wanted this song to be sung at my, funer my funeral. But then after I heard some churches try to sing the song, I asked the girls if they would just have somebody read the lyrics to the song at my <laughs> memorial service. I knew I could trust him because I knew how gifted he was musically, so I gave him the music. He did an awesome job. Often I'm hindered on my way, burden so heavy I almost fall. Then I hear Jesus sweetly say, heaven will surely be worth it all. Heaven will surely be worth it all, worth all the struggles that here befall. After this life, with all of its strife, Heaven will surely be worth it all. I keep reminding myself of that. I keep saying that aloud to myself sometimes. Something we need to remember. But boy, there are some songs that have some phrases in it that become very, very meaningful to you after you've lost your spouse and you come to church. Loneliness, how about some other things? Let's, at least five more. Five things that you would relate to widowhood. Loneliness was one. What I could have done. What I could have done. Regret. Regret. One of the chapters in uh, the book over here that I have before the end comes is a chapter about regret. You know, regret is inevitable because we're human. We're going to have things that we're going to regret in our life. But we can actively reduce regret by living right now. So yeah, there are regrets that are involved with widowhood. How about some others? Money management. money management. It can become a very difficult struggle to manage money. There's a brother by the name of Danny who lives in Crockett County. He and his wife struck a deal. She took care of everything in the house. He took care of everything outside the house. She up and died on him first. She took care of all the finances. She did all the cooking. She knew about all the taxes and the insurance. She up and died on him. He ends up calling me for recipes because he knows I like to cook and I like to bake. He was clueless about that stuff. 
He didn't know anything about finances. He didn't have a clue. Can you name something else that you might associate with life after spousal loss? Yes, sir. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Spoken by a man who's been married, by the way, 66 years. By the way, has anybody else been married more than 66 years? This is like an auction. Going once, <laughs> going twice. 66 years. One of the things I told them was they're almost old enough to be my parents. I turned 69. Now, you need to pick something out of the golden chest of prizes. Now, let me mention something. There's one thing here that if you pick, sir, you might want to pick this one. Love you more than coffee. I mean, what woman wouldn't want a towel that said that? Now, you make sure. Hey, let me tell you about what happened in. Uh, he drinks a lot of coffee. He drinks a lot of coffee. So it's perfect. Yeah. Hey, by the way, at the end of this session, I want to get a picture of you uh, with that towel. In Dexter, Missouri, one guy answered this question right. He was over here on my right. Him and his wife had been widowed once, and they were married a second time. I took the box over to, over to him because he's the one that answered the question. She said, no, I'll pick for him. She reached down in the box and got him a pair of work gloves. <laughs> That's a great marriage. Uh, think of something else that you would associate with widowhood. Eating at the table by yourself. Eating at the table by, as a matter of fact, do you know that eating at the table by yourself, among the widowed people I know, and I think I know more widowed people than most people, that is an abnormal thing. Most widowed people don't even eat at the table. As a matter of fact, most widowed people don't really... Now, I'm an exception because I like to cook, okay? But most widowed people really don't eat normal. Uh, how many times... I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard a woman say, when the last kid leaves home, it's hard to cook for two. If it's hard to cook for two, what do you do when there's one? You don't. You don't. You eat a lot of leftovers. Yeah. Yeah, you got to cook, though, to get the leftovers. You go out to eat. And you know what? Some widowed females refuse to go out to eat. It's hard. You're used to doing that with your mate. Well, for the sake of time, which I can't believe is passing so quickly, I want to share with you some things. When you've lost your spouse, you're going to grieve because that's natural and normal. And I love the title of Doug Manning's book over there on my display table, the books that I own, <laughs> that you're not supposed to steal. <laughs> I love the title of his book, Don't Take My Grief Away. You've earned the right to grieve. Don't let anybody take that away from you. There might also be relief. And if you feel relief after your spouse passes away, you might feel guilty because you feel relief because you think you should only be feeling grief. It's weird. One of the conflictions, the internal conflictions. Then you've got this issue. Now, because of my clinical, personal clinical diagnosis of overexposure to the female gender, I cry a lot. I also like Hallmark movies. That really makes me weird, doesn't it? <laughs> well, anyway, <clears throat> typically, when you lose your spouse, you're going to do a lot of crying, and you're going to try to stop yourself crying sometimes in public. As a matter of fact, when you start crying in public or with somebody else, what do you say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You have nothing to apologize for. You've earned the right to shed any tear, any time, anywhere. Don't let anybody take that away from you, and don't feel ashamed or embarrassed by that at all. As a matter of fact, them being in your presence with you shedding those tears may be a very educational moment if they've never experienced loss like you have. Go ahead and cry anytime you want to. But you may physiologically not be able to cry. There are some people who can't cry. Now, how are you going to feel if you've lost a spouse and you can't cry? Then you feel guilty. Just like if you feel relief along with your grief, you may struggle with some feelings of 
guilt. I shouldn't be feeling this way or I shouldn't be doing this or why am I not doing this? You're going to have heartache like you've never had before. You're going to raise questions that you've never, ever thought about before. You may have a faith struggle like you've never had before. Remember the the man who brought the demon-possessed only child to Jesus? And the kid would thrash around and foam at the mouth. And and remember what he said? He said, Lord, I believe. And then what did he say right after that? Help my unbelief. A faith struggle. You know what? It's okay if you have a faith struggle. That's nothing to be embarrassed about or ashamed of. You know why you have a faith struggle? Because you're this side of eternity and you're still in a human body. And you live in a fallen world. And that makes it difficult. It's okay to admit the fact Even if you're a preacher, a shepherd in the Lord's church, a father, a mother, a boyfriend, a friend, there's nothing to be embarrassed about if you're having a faith struggle. As a matter of fact, if you're having a faith struggle because of your life circumstances and your thoughts and your feelings, let somebody else know that. It's important for other people to know. There is a book I bought because my wife was an avid window shopper, what used to be called a window shopper. I used to brag about the fact I had more mileage on my pedometer than any male on the face of the earth because of all the walking I did in malls. I saw this book, How to Go Shopping with Your Wife and Enjoy It. When I saw that book, I got to buy that book. (laughs) Well, in that book, Carl D. Mills writes this. Each of us has lives inside of her and his own skin. No one can get inside there with us. We are all alone and no one knows what we are experiencing inside. The only way someone can know what we are experiencing is for us to convey a message to them, letting them know. If you're dealing with a struggle, there's a reason why we have a church family. There's a reason why God's blessed you with brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's okay to let other people know that you're struggling, even with your faith. You're going to experience loneliness like you've never experienced before because the loss of a spouse is a very unique and difficult experience. If you're half of a whole and the whole no longer exists, what are you? That's what we talked about at the Laverne Church of Christ Monday night. We're starting, we're launching a Rutherford County widowhood ministry in Laverne, Tennessee. My oldest daughter, Michelle, who lives there, her and uh, her fiancé are uh, key people in that ministry, leading that ministry. And we talked about this very issue Monday night at that get-together. You know, sometimes our personal identity is associated with our experiences our job, then you've got the business of being somebody's husband or being somebody's wife. And legally, you're not anymore. And in God's sight, according to Romans 7, you're released or free, yet in your mind and in your heart, you're still connected. There's an identity crisis. Who are you? You have to reestablish an identity for yourself. There can be financial jeopardy, as we alluded to. You're dealing with forced change, and you have to become resilient, and you have to learn to react in ways that are uh, helpful and productive, and you've got to deal with the absence of that person. You look at the chair, the chair they always sit in. They're not there. There was a lady who just the other day She lives not too far from here. She posted this on Facebook. I want to share it with you. Why? Why? I have Poppy's shirt. Poppy was how she referenced her husband. I have Poppy's shirt that I've slept with every night since August. Slowly, slowly, the smell is fading. I will still have memories, but some things are slipping away. It seems like it was only yesterday I saw the EMTs take him out of our house, never to return. Our plans are not God's plans, but the human side of me still wonders. 
Why? Mm, what a struggle. The absence of that person is a real struggle. It's not uncommon to have dreams about the person years later. I've talked to widowed people over a decade uh, later, sometimes 15, 16 years later, and still have dreams about that person. That doesn't mean you're going crazy. That means you're human, and your mind is doing whatever it wants to do. Because all of us have got two things that you'll not find in an anatomy and physiology book, a thinker and a feeler. We have a thinker and a feeler. And that thinker and feeler in us are constantly at work and sometimes not on the same page and sometimes in conflict with one another. And we have dreams about that person. You have to deal with the silence. You know what widowed people often do when they wake up in the morning? Turn on the TV and it goes until they go to bed. It's on. At least it's noise. The emptiness that you feel, you have to deal with. You have a dependence that you need to recognize. One of the books over there on the display table talks about, suggests, uh, after you've lost your spouse, a point theoretically in your life, a board of directors for your life, people that you can go to when you need help or suggestions, people that can be uh, like a sounding board to help you deal with some of the things, maybe things you need to deal with at, how, at the house or the car or financial matters or spiritual matters, but have people that you can depend on for resources. You're going to deal with stress like you've never dealt with before. You may struggle with anger, like the lady down in Florida who told me when she would take a shower, Sometimes she would pound on the wall of that shower and say, why did you leave me? Why did you leave me? Obviously, it wasn't his choice. But see, she was having to deal with what was inside of her. And sometimes there's anger in regard to the medical profession. Sometimes there's anger of, that's even directed toward God. Now, let me ask you this, if you had a child or a grandchild that was angry with you, where would you want them to go? Wouldn't they want you, wouldn't you want them to come to you? And what would you want them to do? You would want them to talk to you about their anger and why they're angry. The same thing is true with our loving father. It's okay to talk to him when we're angry. As a matter of fact, it's a very therapeutic thing to do. Sometimes those conversations where there's anger can be very productive, very helpful, because they can draw us nearer to a father that loves us more than anybody else does. We'll have worries that we, we haven't dealt with before because we're alone now. And we may have fears that we've never experienced before and we may have a restlessness that we've never experienced before, especially at night. In Chester, West Virginia, where I did the first ever attempt at a widowhood workshop, there was an old gentleman that had glasses on that were about as thick as the bottom of the old glass Coke bottle. And he had some tears in his eyes. And he said, Dean, I've got something to add to that list of things commonly associated with widowhood. And his suggestion to add to that list was suicidal thoughts. Have you ever thought about the people that, you know, are at the other end of the pew or sitting back behind you at church? Have you ever wondered about how many of them might have such circumstances in their life that they're actually thinking about that kind of thing? Thinking about it, of course, and doing it are two different things. But that is how rocked you can be by the loss of your spouse. Why is the experience so difficult? Well, tell me another human relationship identified in the unique way that marriage is. It's a one flesh relationship. By the way, I read this on the internet, so I know it's true. Everything on the internet's true. <laughs> Did you know there are 8.7 billion people on the face of the earth? I cannot comprehend that many people. I don't want to be 
that close to 8.7 billion people, but imagine 8.7 billion people. Of the 8.7 billion people, how many of those 8.7 billion are in your marriage? There's only you and that one other person. If that doesn't cause you to look at your marriage relationship special, nothing will. It's the only relationship in the Bible described as a one flesh relationship, and you are the only two people in over eight billion people on planet Earth who are in that relationship. No wonder it's so hard to lose something so special. If you want a recipe for a magnificent marriage, right here it is, the total giving, the total self for a total lifetime. Teach it to your kids. Teach it to your grandkids. Live it in front of your kids and your grandkids. This is how God's glorified in that one flesh relationship. Total giving of the total self for a total lifetime. Now imagine a relationship where you have two people who are committed to that kind of philosophy. They have this magnificent marriage. Now, it's not a perfect relationship. I mean, it's not a perfect marriage. It, there is no, the only problem with marriage is the people in it. And the only problem with the two people in it is they're still human. As much as they love the Lord and as much as they love one another, they're still human. So that marriage is going to be a struggle. There's no perfect marriage. There are only imperfect people who refuse to give up on one another. Now, you've got these two imperfect people that are buying into the total giving of the total self for a total lifetime, and then, push, it's gone. It's gone. There's nobody there to listen to you anymore. You can't hug that person anymore. You can't hold their hand at church. You can't see them anymore. You can't smell them anymore. You don't go to bed with them anymore. You don't travel with them anymore. No wonder it rocks you when you lose a blessing that's this special. There are a lot of things that make it unique to the person. We're all individuals. You know, we, we weren't made with the same cookie cutter. We're individuals. Now, relationships are different too. I've decided there are three kinds of marriages. There are miserable marriages, there are mediocre marriages, and they're magnificent marriages. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, never permit yourself to settle for a miserable or mediocre marriage. Commit yourself to the total giving of the total self for a total lifetime. That's what glorifies God. That proves His wisdom in a very rich and special personal way to everybody who sees you as you interact together in that relationship. The quality of the marriage relationship matters. Imagine the woman who has a husband guilty of domestic violence. She loses her husband. Her widowhood journey is going to be very different than the person who loses their spouse from a magnificent marriage. Families are different. Some families are very private. Some families are dysfunctional varying degrees of dysfunction. But families are different. They're different in how they handle crises. That's going to impact the widowhood. And remember, the family is the first line of ministry to the widowed, but it makes a unique contribution to life after loss. The timelines are different. Brittany over in West Tennessee married a little over 1,300 days. I told you about her. How different that would be than Millie Hartman after 63 years in her second marriage. So how long you've been married is going to affect your widowhood and the experiences that you had while you were married. That's going to affect your widowhood. What if you lost a spouse who was an alcoholic? What if you lost a spouse who was periodically sexually unfaithful to you, but yet you remained in the marriage? See the experiences that we've enjoyed, and then what if you had these awesome, wonderful experiences? See how different your memories would be because of those experiences, and your faith is going to matter. Some people have no faith. Some people have a little faith. Some people have a lot of faith and a strong faith. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to impact widowhood. So for that reason, 
please put this on the list of things never to say to a widowed person. I know how you feel. Don't ever say that. Don't ever say that to anybody who's lost a loved one because you don't. There is no way that you could. You may be able to relate to them. You may be able to have great compassion and even a high degree of empathy, but you do not know how they feel. It is a very unique life after you've lost anything precious, especially if it's a loved one and especially if it's a spouse. At some point in time, I don't know when, but at some point in time, in your grief journey, you come to the proverbial fork in the road. What are you going to do? Now, Helen Keller had a really good concept. When one door of happiness closes, Another one opens, but often we look so long at the closed door, we don't see the one that's been opened for us. But you know, for a time, and I don't know how long a time, for a time all you can do is stare at the closed door. That's just human. That's deep grieving. You just stare at that door and you cannot believe that door's been shut. That person's gone. And you're just so shocked by the experience. You're so blown away by the experience. You just cannot believe that that's happened. You just stare at it. That's a normal and natural thing. And you may do that a lot longer than you ever thought you would. And that's okay. As a matter of fact, after a long time of staring at that door, you're going to become curious. You're going to go and reach for the handle, the knob, and you're going to turn it. And you're going to find out it was locked. And then you've got to deal with that. It's not just a closed door, it's a locked door. And you can't go through that door. That's hard life. Having to deal with something, being forced to deal with something, like the loss of a spouse. It is so crushing. It is, I had no idea until I experienced life after loss. I had no idea how difficult it was for these widowed people that I thought I knew at the church where I preached for all those years. But I learned by experience. It's a pretty tough journey. At some point in time though, You've got to start looking for an open door. You've got to decide, what am I going to do? You know, when you pick up a fork, what have you decided to do? What do you do when you pick up a fork? What have you decided to do? Eat. Okay, what else have you decided? As you hold that fork in your hand, what other decisions are you going to make? Try something new. Try something new. What am I going to eat? So you picked up a fork, you've decided you're going to eat. Now you're deciding, what are you going to eat? What other decisions are you making? How you're going to eat, how much you're going to eat. If you're ever going to stop eating, <laughs> let that fork represent decisions. At some point in time in your grief journey, you've got to get a grip. At some point in time, I don't know when it is, but at some point in time, you've got to realize, I've got to start making decisions. I've got to start building my identity apart from that person I love that's no longer there. And I need to walk through an open door. When my wife passed away for a number of months, I prayed three things passionately, frequently. Number one, that the Lord would open a door of opportunity for me to continue to minister in a full-time way after she died. I'd already resigned from the pulpit so I could take care of my wife. I wasn't about to try to intrude back into the pulpit. Uh, the church could have been split by that. I knew I needed to move on. I wanted to continue to serve the Lord and be a servant of His in a full-time ministry. I prayed the Lord would open a door of opportunity for ministry. 
Number two, I prayed for the vision to see the open door. Sometimes the Lord opens doors, but we're so busy in our hectic lives and so distracted by menial things, we don't see the open door. So I prayed for the vision to see the open door. And thirdly, I prayed for the courage to walk through that door that I'd never, ever walked through before in my life. I tried to get a job in the southeast part of the United States because of a daughter in Middle Tennessee, Gainesville, Florida, and around the Atlanta, Georgia area. Do you know how hard it is for a Yankee to get a job in the southeast part of the United States? (laughs) When strike one, he's 61 years old. Strike two, he doesn't have a wife. And strike three, he doesn't talk like them. You know, he's a Yankee. Murray City, Tennessee, that, that little, I call it the little church with a big heart, was the church that took me in. We were a great match. They were a grieving church because they weren't what they used to be. I was a grieving spouse because I'd lost my spouse. We were a perfect match. But we've got to be looking at the rest of our life. At some point in time, we've got to walk through the door. So you've got choices to make. What what are you going to do with the rest of your life? You're still living. You're still breathing. Back there on the wall... One of the three mottos of the Widowhood Workshop Ministry is don't die until you're dead. Don't die until you're dead. Sometimes when you lose a loved one, you feel dead. That's how you feel. You might even wish you were dead. But you're not. You're still alive. We've got to make a choice not to die until we're dead. So what are we going to do with the rest of our life? I highly recommend don't waste your pain. Use what you've experienced in your life for the glory of God. Use the experience that you've had, as painful as it is, use that experience to be a blessing to others because you've experienced something that could be a great blessing if you're willing to share it with other people. What are you going to do? Well, one thing's for sure. You're released or free. Now, you may not feel that way, but again, looking at it wisely, the way God looks at it, you are released and free in regard to your widowhood or in regard to your marriage. You're now in widowhood. You've transitioned from married to widowed. You didn't want to. It is involuntarily single. You're involuntarily single. You've been forced to be single. You're released. No matter how you feel, that's the truth. You have a unique life circumstance. There's some unique phrases used in 1 Corinthians 7 to describe people who are not married. Without care, cares for the things of the Lord, pleasing to the Lord without distraction. He is not demeaning or downgrading in any way marriage. He's the same inspired writer who wrote Ephesians 5 about husbands loving their wives, even sacrificially, and wives respecting their husbands and having a beautiful relationship like the relationship of the Lord to the church. What he's talking about here is the reality is Whenever you have a relationship with that other person, that other person is your first human priority. When you no longer have that first human priority, what are you going to do with all the time and energy that you spent in that relationship? Which hopefully was a lot. What are you going to do with that? I highly recommend choosing to recognize your availability. Choosing to recognize a unique flexibility you have now and choose to realize you have a lot of valuable experience that you could use to help other people. Now, this is uh, not disrespecting my wife. I would have never gone to Murray City, Tennessee if I was married. Now, the reason why, it's not because there were only 650 people there in Murray City, Tennessee. It was because it was 30 minutes away from the closest Walmart. My wife could not have survived 30 minutes away from the closest Walmart. So I could go there. I didn't have to ask her, honey, what what do you think about going there and working for the Lord together there? See, I was more flexible, and it was a decision that I was going to make, and my children were just going to have to accept that decision. But it was my choice to make. So we can use what we've experienced for the glory of God. Widowhood's not just a time of grief. You know, we associate it with grief. It's a time of transition, a time of adjustment. It's a time of opportunity. Yeah, it's true. One door has closed. 
but there's another one that's opened. At some point in time, there's going to be another one opened. We need to look for that open door of opportunity. So what's going to be your new normal? What do you want to make for a new beginning? You have to decide about that and then decide how can I get there. See, for me, after my wife passed away and after I'd done the research trying to find help for myself, I decided this is it. This is what I want to do. For the rest of my life, if I ever choose to remarry or, or I choose to do another ministry in addition to this, uh, I'm committed to doing this the rest of my life. Bringing attention to the challenge of widowhood, encouraging people to use their loss for the glory of God. Your future, after your loss, your future is going to be what you make it. You've got to decide what are you going to do with the rest of your life. How many of you saw the movie a few years ago, I Can Only Imagine? That's an awesome movie. Great, powerful moral to that movie. You know, here's this kid that grows up in a highly dysfunctional family. He has a, a father who's a monster. His mother leaves because she can't stand it anymore, so he's stuck there with this monster of a father. Uh, for relief, he plays music occasionally on his guitar. He writes lyrics. After he graduates from high school, he leaves. Uh, he gets a job setting up for this band, and when he's setting up the equipment for this band, he overhears that their lead singer doesn't show up. So he volunteers to be the lead singer. And uh, it's kind of like the part, this is something else you young people have to Google. They're, they're like the Partridge family. They get them a bus, they paint the bus, and they start going all over creation, and they're doing these little gigs, these uh, little concerts that they're doing. And, and uh, this boy that had the monster of a father, he gets connected with this music agent and encourages the music agent to come and and become familiar with them because he's wanting this music agent's help to become a bigger group and more profitable and more recognized. And at a turning point in the movie, the music agent at the end of the concert gets in the boy's face and said, son, you're halfway decent, but you'll never amount to much in this industry until you take your pain and you make it your inspiration. You take your pain and you make it your inspiration. The boy went home. Over a period of time, he developed a relationship and a reconnection with his father. His father somehow had found the Lord. And then after they had rebuilt a relationship, he left and went back to the group. And Mercy Me is the name of the group. And they become a big name group. A group. And the movie's called I Can Only Imagine, after one of the song titles that they're famous for singing. Use your pain as your inspiration, your inspiration to help other people. God is often glorified best by those who take their burdens and then convert them into blessings by helping others because of their experience. And that's true of any kind of a burden that you bear any loss that you suffer, any pain you experience. God can be glorified in our prosperity by how we handle our prosperity. God can be glorified by our adversity and how we handle adversity. We're going to sing a song here uh, to finish up. Cheryl Wayne. I want to encourage you to, if you are able, uh, to come tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning in the lesson, we're going to be doing a study of Psalm 31. It's what we ought to do when we're overwhelmed. It's a great, powerful psalm about how David handled his overwhelming life circumstance at one point. And then in the Bible class afterwards, we're going to talk about praise the Lord no matter what. No matter what's going on in your life, praise the Lord. And then in the afternoon session after lunch, we're going to be talking about something that I think young people, teenagers and young adults, they need to hear this as well as those who have lost their spouses. It's about marriage with a primary emphasis on especially after loss. But you can't talk about marriage after loss until you talk about marriage. It's a great lesson for those who've never been married. And hopefully, we'll help some people not make a mistake in their decision to get married, whether it's the first time or a time after loss. So if you can come back tomorrow, we'd love to have you here.
I how Chad did this. There he did it. That's it right there. I hope when you sing this song in your congregation, that teeter-totter comes into your mind because it makes us look at things totally different. Very familiar, but let's sing as if this is the truth in our life. When upon life billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings and them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings and them one by one, count your blessings and what God has done.